like to introduce my dear friend and brother, the brilliant philosopher Ken Wilbur. It is my honor and my pleasure to introduce Brother Cornell West. We're here to give at the invitation of Larry and Andy Wachowski a little commentary on the Matrix trilogy, and we hope you enjoy it as much as we do. Matrix 3, after the historic reversal of Matrix 2, which undermines Matrix 1, what awaits us? Nothing like it in the culture, American and world culture. One of the things that we are trying to do in this commentary is make, make each commentary of each of the three parts fairly self-contained. But one of the points that Cornell and I have been trying to make, which we think is very important, is that you really have to read or see, interpret the Matrix trilogy as a whole, that all three of them are indispensable to understanding the rest of them. And so in this case, it really would help if you're following the commentary and having a good time interpreting it with us as we are, then it really would help to see all three and listen to the ongoing commentary. At the same time, we're going to try to make these as self-contained as we possibly can under the circumstances. But the richness of the trilogy is what each of the acts informs and tells us about the others. Absolutely. You see these cuts? It's like the biblical Three. Judas, huh? Mm -hmm. All three realms, body, mind, and spirit, Zion, Matrix, and the machines are all continuing to change and evolve. And we're going to see that reach a very, very fast rate very soon. That's One of the ongoing things that I believe audiences had a little bit of a hard time with the first time that they would see this and I know it took me a little bit of, of, of uh, watching it to continue to orient myself to it even though I was looking for the unfolding the ongoing narrative as it continues to kind of deconstruct itself as it goes along and give us richer and deeper meanings is we pretty much established and we both agreed in in part two that one of the things that Neo is continuing to do is learn his way around in the matrix with his new and expanded awareness mm -hmm. he's learning new mm -hmm. things about it. He knows what he can try, what he can't try. He's already seen that there's the oracle who represents sort of female intuition. There's the architect representing sort of more masculine, rational, mathematical approaches to it. There's the Frenchman who's this incredible sort of essence of joyous power, evil power, joyously engaged. And each of the fights that he that Neo gets into and each of the lessons he learns, he's learning his way around in this this territory that's changing. And what we're going to see here is just a continuing exploration of the phenomenology of the Matrix. All of this is being done because the Matrix is one of these three realms. There's the machine world, the world of the Matrix, and the world of Zion. And somehow they're still dissociated. They're still fragmented. They're still at each other's throats. Mm -hmm. And he's still yeah. learning his way around. If he's going to be the one, he's going to have to discover new ways to get them back together. One, one way I think about this is in terms of the Greek notion of paideia, which is this cultivation of a self and the maturation of a soul and the formation of an attention away from the frivolous to the serious to undergo the kind of change and transformation such that one can at, at, attempt to reach a certain level of enlightenment, if not downright wisdom. I like that idea. I think that I think it's a really good way to summarize what we're going but, to see. But we're going to see his Indeed. evolution, as it were. Careful Back in the realm of power. Back in the realm of power, even in this marginal space. This is an important confrontation with power because the train man governs the link between two of these three worlds that need to be reharmonized, reconnected, befriended. And in this case, between the matrix realm of the mind and the realm of the machines, and we still have yet to see the revelation of what the machines are when we see them the way Neo will see them, which is they're made of light. This is one of the real confrontations with power, possibly the last major confrontation with power before Neo has to come to terms with what Smith is. This, this again, a very rich, rich, three-dimensional chess game that we're being asked to play by the Wachowskis. And again, I applaud them for doing it because um, it really does demand a wonderful intellectual engagement, a passionate engagement in order to follow this. But if you get your mind set on the fact that it's a wonderful mystery and not just a mindless action sci-fi... That's Right. Then you can really That's get right. drawn into trying to go with it instead of just standing back going, wait a minute, is this where the car chase happens? Right. And there's real meanings to be discerned as one tries to unravel. And it's wonderful to see Morpheus in his post-dogmatic condition. 
that he's now going to have to respond to these realities that are changing, undergoing transformation for, without falling back on the dogmatic assumptions that he had before. And it's fascinating to keep track of this. And Mobile Ave is there for a purpose. I mean, all of these things have. I think one of the things that critics missed is they would see these things and, and say, I've seen a few critics say, well, they're just making it up, they're throwing this in and so on. I think one of the things that we've tried to show is that there really is a coherent type of interpretation that's possible. There are very explicit things that are pointed out. It's pretty hard to miss them when you see them. Um, and, and if critics would be just a little bit more intelligent in terms of what this thing is offering instead of expect the kind of knee-jerk action sequence that they seem to, that's right. I think that they right. get a much better reading of part two and part three. No, I mean, most of these critics just too lazy, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Power of love. But where we are from, this is the point you were making before, though, Brother Ken, about how the different realms begin now to interpenetrate and integrate. We see this kind of genuine feelings of love among the program yep. and the machine world themselves. I think that's a good point. And a, one of the things that we noticed the Matrix up to this point, and there's still a, a fair amount of it, is it's governed by what is perceived to be anyway the realm of purpose. Everything has a purpose. In a rigid, uh, it's almost dogmatic sense itself, the matrix is. So even the key maker, it's all meant to be. It's all meant to be. It's this rigid kind of programmatic thinking. And one of the ways to read this is that when the mind is alienated, when the mind is not used in the correct way, it's used merely as rote, repetition, dogmatic, mm. fixed, rigid category, stereotypical thinking, if you will. That's not the way you use the mind. So if we're going to see the matrix freed, it's going to be the mind freed from that kind of rigid purpose in the, in the really deterministic sense, the kind of causality that the Frenchman likes. So, yeah, exactly. Because to understand that is to have power and to have control. And that's the one thing. Remember, I think there's a real new you and I've talked about this, and I think we agree there's a real important, one of the dialectics here is between choicelessness, meaning a, sort of a divine acceptance, finding that ground of being, and purpose. How do you get both of those together? Not just one, and not just the other, but both of them together. So that's, the purpose is, is a constant theme that's running through here. And the last thing I want to just say about that, and I think you'll um, relate to this as well. Neo as a redeemer or a liberator or an enlightened one or a messiah, any of the great archetypes that we want to use to describe what the one might be. He's very unique in many ways. One of the unique ways we've seen is that he chooses what we believe to be both eros and agape. In other words, he does have a capacity for loving humanity on the whole, but he chooses a particular person. He goes through, quote, the wrong door. Which turns out, of course, to be the right door. Right. Right. But he the makes, courageous, the courageous. He made the a courageous that's, choice. That's a courageous choice. But he does another thing that's very rare, but I think, particularly in the light of Eastern traditions and the Western mystical traditions, a very profound thing. How many times have you heard him say, I don't know? He's supposed to be the one. He goes, I don't know. I don't know this. He doesn't lie about the fact that he doesn't know. And there's a wonderful mystical tradition, both East and West, epitomized in the West by the cloud of unknowing, which is when you really are open, when you really want to be infused with divine love or divine understanding, you have to empty your own mind. You have to be willing to say, I don't know. You have to be willing to have that beginner's mind, that fresh mind, that mind that can learn. And he says, I don't know more than any Messiah I can remember in recent history. And that's I think that's what point. lets him keep learning. Very important. I mean, one thinks to Socrates, that he knows more than anyone else because he knows that he knows nothing. Yeah, exactly. That sense of openness, sense of awe, sense of wonder, yeah. sense of exploration and perplexity rarely associated with the messianic figure but socrates himself a kind of saint of the life of the mind i think that's exactly right and what we find um, um, among this kind of liberator is that his own mind is as free of dogma as as humanly possible so many factors are about to be drawn together so many pieces of the puzzle are are really within about the next half hour come colliding together the meaning of the machines, the meaning of the matrix, the meaning of Zion. And it's really getting set up here in a way that's going to be really quite extraordinary. The aesthetics of this whole sequence from the red light there to the hall there is just really beautiful. The green color, of course, reminding us that we're still in the matrix in the world of the mind, the mind not yet redeemed or liberated. 
And therefore, many, many of these battles, as, as we discussed last time, Cornell, the mm -hmm. battles in the matrix are the battles of ideas, the battles that are going on within the mind. And there's certainly action, but they also are representing some of the real conflicts that the Matrix Trilogy is dealing with. I mean, it's just fascinating to use the most sophisticated postmodern cinematic effects to wrestle with some of the oldest questions known to humankind. Indeed. Indeed. And still, on this issue, we still have to confront, obviously, the Frenchman. Oh, yes. Essence of power. We've got to so go here back we've to the got. Power. Here, this is wonderful. This is not just. This isn't blue. So this isn't Zion in the world of body. This is the world of the body as it appears in the Matrix under the guise of power. And that's what's so exquisite about this whole particular sequence through here. It's sort of bondage, discipline, power, positive and negative aspects of it, but as an idea, as what it represents as an idea. And this is still a kind of power that has to become to terms with if you're going to get out of the Matrix, if you're going to unite it with the other realms. And the aesthetics on this, just exquisite as well. Nice. He's still in that power causality no play, isn't he? <laughs> but That's how he thinks. He's a one-track mind. Kind of he's making a reference to the, uh, the fortune teller constitutes his threat in some way. Well, Seraph being another shell, he's referring, I believe, to the Oracle and what she's like so-called intuitive fortune telling mm. and sending Seraph as part of the party. He just finds all of this amusing. There is something I want. I love that line. That is a great summary of, of power. And Morpheus had actually said a similar thing earlier in terms of no chance, no coincidence, no accidents, just causality. But he's reading it as... If you know the cause, yes, you can no. control, control the effect. Control it, absolutely. Yeah. Checkmate. Yeah. Sanity. <laughs> you just equated What's love with insanity and the centrality of belief. Okay. The way in which Neo finds himself in a world between three worlds, which happens to do has to do with this limbo, as it were. Uh, he's torn on the one hand for his love for Trinity, torn on the other hand to return to the source. And of course, Mobile Avenue can actually be viewed as limbo in terms of the scramble of the letters themselves. And nothing but love is able to rescue him from that limbo, that fourth world as it were, or at least this world betwixt and between the three that, uh, that we've been talking about, and especially Brother Ken with such uh, acuity and uh, perspicacity. He gets out of that, just as you said, again, he and Trinity are in this together. Yeah, he absolutely. gets out of it with Trinity's help. And I think that's that's the way they get out of that particular limbo after confronting the power issue. Yeah. It's back to love. And I think that's a very good point. Thanks for, for recircling on that one. Very decisive events are about to unfold in all three of these major domains. World of Zion, World of the Matrix, World of the Machines. And if Neo's going to have a hand in it, like you said, this is his last chance. Here we get the love theme again. We got the love theme. She's a love child herself. Yeah. I'm beginning to see the light. Same old song. Absolutely. Beginning to see the light. And this is the real source, not the old dogmatic source that the architect was talking about. The old mathematician, the architect. I think we nailed him, Cornell. That's true, but she's a very unique program in the machine world to be so insightful. But still remarkable Intuitive. that she is a program of the machine. Exactly. So the machines are starting to be not so evil, Not maybe. so evil. More human, humanized. Yeah. That, I think, is very, very crucial. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. Cornell, we have indeed talked about Smith representing a certain factor that has to be integrated with Neo, that both of them, in a sense, are half the equation. And she just says exactly the same thing. She says, he's your opposite, but it doesn't mean that one is going to win and the other has to be obliterated. The only way for wholeness is both of them have to be included somehow. They both are going to have to interpenetrate each other. They're both going to have to become one in order to have a full liberation because otherwise something's left out something's marginalized something's pushed away and the matrix is not about marginalizing we've seen this across mm -hmm. the board it is an inclusive radically integral statement and so i think in this sense it's almost like matter and antimatter and the way those two once you put matter and antimatter together it's not that matter wins and antimatter loses they're both transformed into a blaze of light 
Mm. And that blazing light is always love, healing, inclusiveness, and so on. And my bet is that that is really one of the directions that this is going to go. But for that to happen, Neo has got to stop merely fighting Smith. Now, of course, they're going to have the last battle. It's going to be a battle in the green world of the Matrix where ideas are fighting. But as long as Neo is resisting that, when he finally opens up, in a sense, and lets Smith enter him, that's when they both... Mm turn into light in a sense. And in many ways I view it as a challenge to each and every one of us because if in fact we define ourselves by through growth wrestling with our double, you think of Dostoevsky's writings on the double, or Goethe's writings on the double, or yep. even Robert Musel's writing on the double. Through growth and maturity is a wrestling with the double inside of each and every one of us. Again, the kind of civil war taking place on the battlefield of our own souls. Right. Then in fact the Wachowskis are saying something not just in a filmic narrative, but directly to us as existential agents trying to make sense of the world facing death and trying to do so with a sense of significance as we live. Uh, well put. And I even Rilke said, for example, I'm afraid that if my demons leave me, my angels will take flight as well. Mm. And that's, again, what we're talking Absolutely. about here. It's, we're not supposed to kill one and embrace yeah. the other. We're supposed to embrace them both. And then they both are transformed. And I do Powerful. believe we're driving towards something like that. Powerful. He's sitting, sitting there waiting for them. Yeah. Now, of course, Smith left to his own devices. He's just as fragmented as Neo is, and he's dangerous on his own. Absolutely. Again, I think the point that we've made before about the split between, on the one hand, Neo, on the other hand, Agent Smith, when Smith is alone, isolated, autotelic, autonomous. Yeah. It is a world of choicelessness, but it's a negative world. It's yeah. a dark world. Yeah. It's a deterministic world of right. a kind of a negative fate. And make those jokes about how much she knows and how he had no choice to do what he's just yeah. done. Yeah. It's both a play that the Wachowski brothers are doing, but also an enactment of what happens when Neo and Agent Smith are unable to come together and mutually enrich uh, each other into a new kind of state of consciousness, as it were. Indeed. Now, we know that the Oracle has not really died. She's going to be liberated herself and reappear towards the end. So this is all part of this ongoing evolution of reintegrating some of these things. But that's a question everybody can be asking right now. Because they're all in the process of not being their old selves. Neo is starting to feel the interior of the machine world. Just the simple aesthetics of even a good old science fiction shot like that, Cornell. It's powerful, brother. Uh, powerful. Uh, nowhere can you see the whole notion about who am I more acutely than Smith has actually entered Bane. And this is the first time that a representative of the machine world has entered the human world. So we're starting to see these three domains that we've been talking about really starting to interpenetrate each other. Um, Neo is starting to learn to feel the machines. He says, what's happening to me? I can feel them. The machines are entering the humans. We've already seen Smith and Neo somehow inexplicably had intertwined. Had Smith said, somehow we've become a part of each other. All of these kinds of growing interconnections between these domains that have been at war through all three of these movies. And it's still, I think, a little confusing to people because in many ways still caught up in that Manichaean good versus evil. So if the Oracle is good, then Smith has to be all bad. But it's much more complex than that, much more complex. And I think that's why we're going to continue to see a cross-fertilization of these domains until they all actually enrich each other in a certain sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. The machines will bridge Jada looks like an African queen, and mm. so sharp and insightful. And just a beautiful soul, all the way through. All the way through. There's that handsome councilman again. I bet his great-great-granddaddy taught at Harvard. That's just my guess. <laughs> Comes back to that theme of hope. We saw the architect talk about hope as a human quintessential illusion, yet the source of so much of human sustenance. Another domestic scene, this time between the women with the lovely children there. Mm, empathy. Imagine yourself in my shoes. I'd do the same thing out of love. Yeah, the human richness is just oh, he's, he's so touching. Keeps it. 
humanity in it. Mm, commonality of machines and humans there. <laughs> Check the oil. <laughs> that's, a, that's a nice lie. Now they're still operating on the fact that you have to fight. You have to destroy them. There's still separation, alienation. They're still trying to kill what they think is the enemy. Neo has seen something else. He's intuited something else about the machines. He's going to take a different path. These folks are still caught in the old fragmented, pre-redeemed world. He's going to the real source. <laughs> Believe me, believe me, centrality of belief. You can take mine. And he says, he, the oracle did not tell him. The oracle couldn't know this. This is what the one knows. He knows where the real source is, and he knows what he has to do. I'll pilot this ship. He's going right into the center of what they think is the enemy. This is one of the high moments. A in wonderful the line. Wonderful line. She has been Socratic, questioning. She does not believe in the one capital O. She believes in him, small h. She believes in him as human. She doesn't believe in the one in the messianic sense. And they're banking everything on this belief in each other as finite, fallible human beings, but yet still capable both of choosing and of loving and of being in solidarity with each other. I think that's a really good point, and even the, the, I don't believe in the one, we've seen what the people that believe in the one believe. Even if Neo was the one, he doesn't believe it. In other words, the one has become a myth, a dogma, an idea, a concept that has almost nothing to do with any reality at all, but that's what humans hang their hopes, their fears, their desires on, and become true believers. And Neo, from the beginning, didn't believe in the one either. And so finally, somebody else agrees with him. I don't believe in the one either. I do believe in that guy. In other words, he has a judgment as a human that can do this thing. Now, he might indeed end up showing almost superhuman capacities in a, in a, in a sense of highest human potential that could be seen as divine. He indeed might become one with this wonderful transcendental light. And in that sense, might be something like a divine God person. But it's not the one of mythology and the one of dogma. It's the one of concrete human flesh that's chose to love a particular woman, fight a particular cause, and now he's going to do what nobody else, not the oracle, not the architect, not nobody said to do. He's going right to the heart of Machine City, which they think is the enemy. He knows different. Human, human, all too human. Shot through with genuine love. Well, in a sense, they're both going to die. That's a very subtle, touching thing. He's saying, I hope you know what you're doing. He can't quite get over his own dogmatic belief. But he, he says, it's an honor knows. knowing you. And he looks up and says, it's still an honor it's knowing you, even though I'm not you. quite sure what is going on. Absolutely. <laughs> and even Morpheus now is just disoriented. You know, Fishburne does a wonderful job portraying he, that. And at that point, I think he becomes fully human for the first time, first in a time. sense. Wonderfully he fully just, human. Just feet on the ground. Yeah. Even he is almost to the point where Jada is. He doesn't trust the one. He doesn't know what it is. But he's going to trust Neo. Absolutely. Again, these sequences are all important because this is a fight that starts to, that is occurring in Zion, in the world of the body. Not just a fight in the Matrix and not a fight in the machine world. Usually you fight the agents in the Matrix. Mm. This is in the world of Zion. In the world of Zion, the way the machine world appears is as machines. All of a sudden now, though, Smith has, in a sense, descended right down into human flesh. And so the battle's going to be fought there. Neo's going to have to fight the battle in the world of the body, and then he's finally going to have to confront Smith in the world of the mind or the matrix. And until those two battles are resolved, there's not going to be, if there is this matter and antimatter getting together, it's not going to happen until those two things happen and are resolved one way or another. But never in human bodies. Again, the battle has to be resolved on the bodily plane as well as in the matrix. I admit it is difficult. Now it's almost down to Cain and Abel and Romulus and Remus. It's a real just brotherly battle here. What's so astonishing is that the Matrix trilogy still hasn't yet revealed the nature of Machine City. 
So it's still not really clear the secret bond that's going on here. And that's why, it, uh, you know, it's amazing that it can carry on this far, but it also can contribute to uh, continuing audience confusion to some degree. This point, I believe, is very important because Neo becomes physically blinded. That means he can't see. Absolutely. And it's so important because we're talking about these other dimensions. Uh, Zion is the only place up to this point where there are human bodies. So it's not that there are just bodies there, but Zion does represent the world of body. The matrix is just the world of the mind. Now, it's not the only thing that's going on there, and it is not to say that there aren't minds elsewhere, but the matrix does represent the mind. Machine City, we're about to see what that is when Neo says it's made of light. The interesting thing now, though, is that he is physically blinded. Pretty soon, though, it's going to show what he can see from his point of view. And it's a world of light and a world of subtle energy. And that's very important in terms of the overall interpretation of what it is that's going to be united or integrated or healed. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very deliberate move on the part of uh, the Wachowskis here. I think that uh, when you think of Tiresias, who is the example of the haunted humanism of Sophocles, a haunted humanism that actually is based on the wholesale rejection of the messianic model of the one capital O that we have seen so clearly. And the shift now to a much more haunted humanistic project of the many small M and the particular role that the many now must play given the fact that looking toward the Messiah capital M is now trumped, is now foreclosed, as it were. And you think of the move, for example, from Christian formulations of Messiah to Forbach to Strauss, all the way through William James, the move toward the many, the preoccupation with the plebs, the demos, themselves having a creative role to play, being interdependent on one another in order to pull off a kind of salvific project, but a salvific project that is small s now having to do with sustaining one another, creating a certain community and sustaining the solidarity that allows for that community to flower and flourish. A democratization of the God-man, so to speak. Exactly. And I think even though um, Neo clearly will have some kinds of messianic or bodhisattvic activities to do, uh, and he alone can do, well, he and Trinity alone can do, they really are a unit. Absolutely. They and can't do it without the help of others. That's right. It's now horizontal. Yes. It's now horizontal. Horizontal. Or maybe now. horizontal and vertical, and not merely one or the other. Well, I wonder, even the vertical now is no longer vertical connected to one capital O no. and God capital G, but, but it might be vertical in the sense of love is still a form of transcendence. Uh, yes, Absolutely. I, yes. Absolutely. And that Neo, Neo still, Neo slash Trinity is still the only ones that can do this particular right. thing, but now only with the help That's of right. the others. That's right. Inter interdependent, interrelated with yeah. the other. Yep. Yeah. Intimate relations. Yeah. <laughs> Machine man. Open a can of whoop ass, you I'm bet. Telling you. They all have a role to play. Each human being has a crucial role to play. Mm -hmm. Command there. Warrior princess indeed. I'm telling you. Humanistic to the core. All of the factors are coming together. This is just so. All three domains are on a collision course. And they're either going to be in their old way alienated from each other, intent on mutual destruction. Hang on to your lunch roll. In which case victory is going to be one of them simply exterminating the others. Or Neo slash Trinity are going to be part of cracking the code at the source. Any old science fiction movie would simply have one of these three worlds exterminate the others. That's right. That's and that's right. not what's going to happen here, which is so astonishing. What a sight. Beautiful. In its own wonderful way. Really exquisite. Well, and here it comes. Here comes the whole collision course now. What a sight. And again, just hardly... I'm sure everybody's appreciating our hushed silence through this one. Uh, one actually cannot but be awed by these kinds of scenes here. Mm. Boy, talk about swarm. Degenerate form of cicadas just taking over everywhere. She's a courageous one. One of the many. Doing her job. 
choosing to do her job. You talk about being dependent on one another mm -hmm. as human beings. Yeah, it's so beautiful. That's why, again, we're just being very quiet and watching this, but I can't help but think of Lenny Reifenstahl shooting the Nuremberg rally. I mean, it's an aesthetic shot of a horrifying destruction, but it's so beautiful. It's just amazing. But we really are getting ready to come up on the other side of the story, which of course is what Neo and Trinity are about to do. And whatever they're going to do, they better do it very, very quickly. Here's our 16-year-old brother. This late in the game, and they're still operating on the assumption that they're going to have to kill the machines in order for victory to occur. And that's, we know because we, of course, have seen this, that that's not how victory is going to happen. But that's what's so, I keep referring to this as a gutsy movie, a gutsy trilogy, because we're still about to get the key to a lot of this still hasn't really been unfolded yet. It's going to happen in another five or yeah, ten minutes. Yeah, yeah. In the meantime, we're still being treated to the, a classic good versus evil, almost Manichaean battle again. And that's not the way they resolve this, as we well know. So I think the way they push it right up to the end continually like this is what makes it such an extraordinarily courageous move. And certainly confused a lot of critics. I believe... <laughs> we did it, solidarity, human solidarity. Most movies would end right now. Uh huh. Of this, of the old traditional genre, they'd stop right now. But just like you couldn't really have the Matrix work, no matter how hard the Oracle and the Architect work, the Matrix is unstable because it's not integral. It's not inclusive. That's Zion is unstable because they are excluding something. That's right. Other ships were lost under equally. That wonderful line of some things change, some things never do. One thinks about this genre itself, that we're at a moment where it looks as if the triumph of the heroic victory. And I think the Wachowski brothers in part are reflecting, reflecting on a meta level in terms of the nature of heroic fiction, the nature of heroic movies and how one must have this major clash, this major fight between two forces, titanic forces. And yet at the same time, they're going to disclose and reveal the limitations of that genre, the limitations of those kinds of gestures and techniques associated with this genre of her heroic filmmaking. And we need to keep that in mind as the movie continues to unravel. Well said. Isn't yeah, that beautiful? See, that's, 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 that's the Morpheus that, we really love. That's the Morpheus I love, too. He that, has metamorphosized into a mature, self-questioning, open-minded human being. And, and, and believing for the right reasons, in a sense, if we could put it that way. Not just believing a myth, not a dogma, which we have found the hard way. Six other guys tried those myths, that, and it just recycled humanity. That, that number of men and women that would rebuild Zion, that's the number of chromosomes in a human body. It's just recycling the crap over back and, and back over again. And exactly. Over again. And so Morpheus had to break out of that. He's been spouting the one is this and the oracle this and the one and that. God bless him, but he was a, just off track on that. And now we're back, of course, to Neo, who can no longer see with a physical body, but what he's going to see with his subtle body, or his spirit body, even if you will, is going to hold the key to a lot of the reconciliation that's going to happen. Still in the world of blue, so this is the world of the body, the world of flesh, but as the machines are, are entering it, it's, and this is where we actually see what they're going to really be made of. Of course, back to part one. This is the first thing we saw at the beginning, and all we assumed was that this was absolute horror. We're over the fields, aren't we? He can feel them. How do you know that? And now he can see what they're really made of. Lines. That's what she sees. That's what you see, the world of flesh. What's well, important to keep in mind, we've seen earlier references of love as a species of insanity and a certain kind of human maturity even characterizes crazy. 
But we know historically that when you fall outside of the box, think outside of the box, go against the grain, become nonconformist, you're easily characterized not simply as crazy and insane, but somebody who's transgressive and a threat. And this notion of being mature, being associated with crazy, has something to do with those who are willing to make certain leaps of faith on the one hand, but recognize that they have to be self-critical in doing it. That Morpheus is not paralyzed. Morpheus is not in any way debilitated. He's still willing to support certain kinds of actions, but he's still self-critical. He's, he's skeptical in one sense, but also willing to act on, on the other. And we even find some of them saying, this is an old archetype itself, that he's crazy. Neo is crazy. Now, Neo is supposed to be the one, but Neo isn't living up to the dogma of the one. And there are people who will crucify him because he doesn't fit the dogmatic myth when he very well might be their best hope. So it's even funny to see people again latching on to a rigid belief instead of a, a living reality. And Morpheus can see him on one hand as crazy, but on the other hand, not lock him into the old dogmatic narrative that we've seen Morpheus pushing in the past. We will make it, and that's really... We will make it. Yeah, exactly. Because in a sense, they're both going to die, but they're both going to make it. Now, that's the blue world, so that's what it looks like with the eye of flesh. And then it's going to keep cutting back to Neo and what it looks like through the eye of spirit, so to speak. The golden light always sort of represents spirit in the trilogy. And mm -hmm. so we're going to get these point of views, these different perspectives back and forth now. And that's where I think we really start to see the overall interpretive matrix of the matrix. What we're going to see, I think, really over the next five or ten minutes is Neo's actual enlightenment, his actual becoming one with spirit, his actual death and resurrection, his own divination in a sense. And there, there seem to be about three major steps to this. He's already died to the physical body, at least temporarily. He's still now sort of at war with the light in the world of machines. But we're going to see even that start to change. So you can really start to see the sort of core of them. Mm. And they're entering him. They continue to have this inner penetration. Come on, Neo. I need help here. But he's still very human, though. He's still very human. And that's, yes, that, yes, that's, the, that's the paradox. It's yeah. both of them. He's open to the various dimensions of that body, mind, spirit. Exactly. Exactly. And yet still very human. And he keeps saying, if you could only see them like I see them, they're made of light. They're all right. made of light. Right. That's interesting. Look at them holding hands. Yeah. The solidarity to the end. Now, the world of the body is starting to transform. Actual, the world of Zion is going to start to change. And the light that was hidden in the machines is going to start bathing Zion at at some point. And that's going to mark part of the real transformation of it, but that hasn't happened yet because Neo still has to come to terms with his opposite, Smith. Mm. Now, I know some critics felt that, in a sense, having Trinity die here was a sort of anti-female statement, and I think that's exactly the opposite of what we're seeing here. We've seen death and rebirth, a constant theme, and they both die together, and I think they're reborn together. We can hear the way they frame it, light everywhere. Wish you could see what I see. They're all made of light. This is a very powerful and poignant moment. In the genre, we don't associate with this level of emotion and this level of attachment. And the reflection on arrows and the way in which death and rebirth are constitutive of love at the personal level and at the larger familial and even social level is something that's worth noting here. All of the interpretations that I've given of the film up to this point about what I'm about to say, I believe all of those are really anchored very strongly in the film, and I'd be very, very willing to defend that interpretation that, that I've been giving, that you've been giving. The, my belief on this part, there's not as much evidence in the film, but I believe be, that they really do die together and are born on that higher level together. And I believe that for a couple reasons. One, Neo himself dies. I mean, he doesn't come back. He's not in Zion. He's not in, in the mind of the Matrix. He becomes one with light, one with spirit, in a sense, dies to his own separateness and redeems, transfigures that 
world in the process. Since he and Trinity have been in this from the beginning, I believe they both die together. She just happens to do it a few minutes before he does. But I believe it's a reasonable interpretation at that moment that the couple now as one enter the heart and die together. I choose as romantic to believe that. No, and it's, it's continuous with the you know, great tradition. It goes back from Plato through Dante all the way up Absolutely. to Ann Carson's and Tony Morrison today. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it's very important to distinguish between Wachowski's conception of love as self-sacrifice or even love as a certain kind of surrender in which one invests the self in the other. This is not stoic resignation. This is not religious obedience. This is something very different. This is a, a profoundly humanistic conception of human beings coming together in such a way that sacrifice and surrender sit at the center. We saw earlier that uh, Trinity herself doesn't fall in love with Neo until Neo is ready to give his life for something bigger than him. There's something about this notion of, of sacrifice of the self that uh, the Wachowskis t take very seriously and I think put at the very center of their conception of Eros. And it's, it's a distinctive conception. It's very different than uh, uh, most religious conceptions would have to do with following a rule or a commandment. And it's very different than stoic resignation where you simply accept what has been given to you and learn how to love it and learn how to embrace it. It's an act, a free act, a choice of sacrificing and surrendering oneself. And let's keep in, in mind, that's, a, I think, a terrific point. And let's remember that in each of those cases, it was self-sacrifice on the one hand, but it was rebirth, resurrection to a higher, deeper self for both of them. And so what I think we see here, because they really do both die here. I mean, Neo just disappears in, in a different way, but they both of them die. But what happens is there is a resurrection in a sense, and I don't want to be, be too theological about it, or certainly not too Christian about it, but there is a, a death and a rebirth that occurs. Remember, we were exploring the theme of the possibility of the union of Eros and Agape. Eros sort of an abstract reaching up in love for the whole, but Agape reaching down and embracing. And what mm -hmm. I believe it's reasonable to read into this is that their love for each other, which is a real agape in that sense, a real reaching down to each other, is about to transfigure Zion and the machine world and the matrix because there is a growth and transformation that occurs. We're going to see that this light that the machines really are ends up being the light that bathes Zion and the spiritual glow at the end. That's because of their death and rebirth, I believe. So I think this is another kind of rift on that theme. This is... Another, in my opinion, really important sequence because we had explored the possibility that what we're really going to see in the next five or ten minutes is Neo's actual awakening, what he actually goes through. And of course, he starts out, he's in just the physical body, but that becomes blinded. Now he's seeing the world of light. In a sense, he's almost walking on water, if you want to get a little theological about it. But he's certainly facing a world of light and energy. And remember that the golden light is always the color of spirit in, mm -hmm. the, in, the, in the Matrix trilogy. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing here is he's starting to see this world of light and of spirit, but he's not yet one with it. And until there's a oneness with it, you can't have reconciliation, you can't have atonement at one minute. So I believe the next thing that we are going to see in this sort of three or four part series of his own awakening, his own liberation, is he has to become one with the world of light. And since Smith, in a sense, represents spirit alienated, Smith is in his own way just as broken and fragmented, but he's the evil side of it, as, as you will. Mm -hmm. And what Neo has to do is finally surrender to letting Smith enter him and Neo enter Smith. And when that happens, I believe, we're going to see this oneness occur. The spirituality in the Matrix, the Wachowskis are friends of spirituality east and west, north and south. So we've seen Kabbalah um, elements, we've seen Zen elements, we've seen mm -hmm. Taoistic elements and so on. But there's a wonderful saying that the Christian mystics have, which is that hell is but the flames of God's love denied. And so if the machines really are at heart, if they really are pure spirit, but that human corruption and vanity caused the machines to turn. It's humans doing it, not the machines. Mm -hmm. Then in a sense, when you deny spirit, when you run from it, when you contract against it, when you deny it, it appears as the flames of hell. In other words, it would appear as demonic machines trying to kill you. 
And so if that part is true, then when he befriends that spiritual realm, the machines are simply going to stop attacking because they're no longer God's love denied, if you will, or spirit denied, or spirit alienated. And so Smith and Neo are going to, in a sense, fuse matter and antimatter. And if that's the correct interpretation, at that point, the machines will stop attacking and a light will start to bathe all three of those realms. The last part of that interpretation is that Neo has to do it not just in the blue realm, representing Zion and the body, the reconciliation of ideas has to occur in the realm of mind, and that means he and Smith have to fight it out in the land of green, the green color known as the matrix. Mm. That's where uh, the final reconciliation is going to have to happen as well. Notice also just very briefly there that this world of light, it's taking the form in the blue world in the world of flesh, an anthropomorphic form. Because men and women can only see the divine through the eyes of flesh if it looks like them. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a wonderful move. I think it's actually brilliant that they, that spirit would have to take on the, a human face in order mm -hmm. to talk to the human world. Mm. But Neo is also seeing light because he's physically blind. He can't be seeing that. So he's mm -hmm. seeing the, the, the spiritual light behind it. But I think it's brilliant that they're playing off both of that. Because as you know, you know, if there is a spirit, we tend to see it through what eyes we have. And if you have just the eyes of flesh in the blue world, then it's going to have to have a human face. And we're going to be anthropocentric. Got exactly. Fulbach on the one hand and Tiresias on the other. There you go. He fights for us. Again, self-sacrifice in the form of love for the others. And now we're in the world of green, we're in the matrix, and therefore it's a battle of ideas here, not a battle of soul or spirit necessarily, but a, the idea. And we've already heard that they represent opposites now, and these opposites have got to come together. The traditional common element of all the world's great traditions is non-duality or yin and yang or unity of opposites. And even the oracle has said, Smith is your opposite. In a traditional Manichaean, Zoroaster, good versus evil thing, then what would happen is one would be totally wiped out and the other would totally triumph and you would celebrate the triumph and the death of the other and etc. But these, these opposites have to be united. There has to be a unity and diversity. So of course they're still going to fight, but at the end, if, if it was going to go the old way, Neo would simply kill Smith. But Neo opens up, goes completely passive, and lets Smith enter him, and they become one. And that is the redeeming act. The rest of me enjoy yeah. the show. Yeah. We've seen Agent Smith is capable of change and metamorphosis as well. Yes, in a he is. Way. Got to keep that in mind, even given his. And one of the worst cases of multiple thing. personality disorders I've ever seen. <laughs> Once again, it's no accident. I mean, everything that the Wachowskis do, this is taking place in water. It's completely water as a symbolism, I don't have to tell you. Not only a baptism, but across the ages in terms of this kind of transformative event. Like all great martial arts, it's choreography. It's a form of exquisite dance. Wonderful grace, style. One of the things that we've found, I mean, one of the things we admired about Neo is that even though he may be the one, or certainly not the one of myth, which doesn't exist, but the person that can put into motion a humanistic healing between these domains, what we admired about him is he would frequently admit that he didn't know what was happening. He doesn't know what's going on. Smith doesn't really know what's going on either because they really are two halves of a broken reality. And, and so what's really interesting is that Neo is still fighting. He's fighting. He's fighting. And it's not going to work as long as he's doing that. Right at the crucial point, Neo gets it and he just relaxes, opens up, and it's sort of thy will be done almost. Mm. And but Yes. Yeah, but I'm just thinking of that line, the purpose of life is to end. Um, you know, Heidegger makes a distinction between perishing and dying. Mm -hmm. and ants perish and human beings die because human beings are conscious of the fact that they will die and therefore the possibility of intense consciousness and engaged life in wrestling with the fact that one will die is a possibility in a way that it's not for ants who perish 
And this, this sentence here, the purpose of life is to end as opposed to die. And we've seen death linked to love, mm -hmm. rebirth. It's quite significant here, and we just want to point that out. And a kind of perishing indeed. And we've seen, for Neo, a whole train of what has defined him is coming to a real point. Right back to his conversation with the architect, the problem is choice. And what is his purpose? And what is he to do? This whole thing about choicelessness or acceptance on the one hand and purpose and drive on the other, how to reconcile those two. And that's also going to come to a very startling conclusion here mm -hmm. where the, he does find a kind of resolution and acceptance by letting go. Oh, wonderful. Mm. Good heavens. Now that's what's gonna happen if they can keep fighting. That can go on forever. We could have thunderstorms and crankiness and testosterone city forever if they're gonna just keep at each other's throats. But there's so much of human history. Indeed. But that really in this case just doesn't do it. He still doesn't quite get it. Neo's still been fighting, but Neo's about to get it. Now that's one of the great moments there. That's what I call chirotic, a kairos moment, a meaning-infused moment. We've seen a variety of them throughout. But here is the high point. And you hear echoes of Ipsis talk about life lies and echoes of O'Neill's talk about pipe dreams, truth, love, truth and love and freedom and so forth, all of these construction concoctions of a fallible mind knowing that our bodies will soon be the culinary delight of terrestrial worms is there something more is there something beyond not so much in another world but still beyond just this base will to live and what in fact does neil say because i choose to i choose to but notice as long as he says, I choose, he's still fighting. Mm -hmm. Something still has to happen. Mm -hmm. He's still in battle mode. And at this point, the movie is still messing with us because they're still going to say, okay, beat him up, kill him. That's it, kill Smith. That's not the way to get out of this. Mm -hmm. I have to hear Trinity whispering in his heart right now. He looks around, he's got to make an entirely different type of stance. Different kind of choice. Different kind of choice in a sense to give up choice or to have that union of them. And that would be in a sense almost the feminine. It would be Trinity saying, My world, my world! Let go. Don't resist. In more ways than you know. We're laying right there. It can't be right. You're both gonna die. See, he doesn't even resist. The two of them have been reunited. In the world of spirit, reborn right there. He turns to light. No, it's not fair. And this is light in the matrix now. And in the world of Zion, in the body, in both of those. And he's the last to get it, but there it goes. Mm. This is the real returning to source for all of them. Really returning to light. The entire matrix now is being redeemed. And there, in the blue world, in the world of Zion, in the world of the body, the same, in a sense, healing redemption. Little bit of a Christian theme there, huh? This music is profoundly spiritual slash religious as mm -hmm. well. But that, the oracle is going to be, in a sense, resurrected, returned to harmony among these three spheres. The machine world can revert to light, and that light's going to end up bathing all of Zion ex beautifully, extraordinarily. True returning to source. He doesn't come back into that world now. He really has returned to source. He and Trinity, I believe. The Matrix is transforming. There's our black cat. Our love child. Yeah. And of course, the two of them are gonna have a little chat about it, but he redeemed them as well, even though, of course, he's gonna be the cranky architect forever. 
and Machine City reverting to light. Bathing Zion now, they're integrated, they're not separate, they're not at war. And of course she's very likely the next savior. They certainly give a hint of that should it be needed. See, did you do that? Uh, a moment of love at the end. I know he'd love it. For Neo. Last grand note of belief. Grand note of belief. The one thing grand that note of belief. there are many, many reflections we can have in this extraordinary trilogy. On this one specific area, I'd, I would like to end this part of it by noting that there are, as you know, two very common, somewhat different forms of spiritual liberation that we find around the world. One is represented more by, let's say, Gautama Buddha, and one more by a Jesus Christ. With the Jesus Christ figure, Christ is one with God, and then others are redeemed, but are not yet themselves one with light or one with spirit. Whereas in a Buddhist tradition or some of the mystical traditions uh, in the West, including mystical Christianity, everybody can become one with spirit and can become liberated. And the, on the only, it's not really a criticism, but I always had a curiosity about what the Wachowskis were doing in this particular case because they're so democratized the rest of it. I always told Larry that if they did a follow-up, that one of the things that would happen is everybody would become one with spirit just like Neo and Trinity did. But that's, again, they're sort of mm. playing with it and mm. having fun and leaving mm. the future open. That little girl, bless her heart, might very well be the one that would end up doing something like that. Mm -hmm. But it is, in this case, mm -hmm. um, a little bit of a messiah left to it, and that, that they achieved oneness and that redeemed these other worlds and let them be whole and healed, but, the, uh, but left that part open. But the democratizing of the One, capital O, is profoundly Emersonian, which is to say that each individual digs deep inside his or her soul yes. to have their own distinctive relation with something bigger than them, especially with a profound faith in love. But it's within the realm of the natural, it's within the realm of the historical. Yes. And I think the film itself, which I think really is one of the, the great filmic epic of our time, I think of other candidates and they fall far short. But by epic, what I mean is projects a vision. In this case, it's a critique and in some ways an indictment of an empire, very different than Virgil's, for example. But at the same time, it also is very much concerned with uh, how the, the quality of our individual lives linked to quest for meaning and the quality of our collective lives linked to various systems of power, structures of domination, forms of conformity and deference and so forth. And, uh, one one has to say that uh, it's really quite a phenomenon. It's actually quite a monument. Let me footnote your Emerson there. Emerson said, history is but an impertinence if it is other than a tale of my own being and becoming. In other words, history is a tale of myself, capital S. Mm -hmm. And that's the mm -hmm. humanization that you're talking mm -hmm. about. And I do believe that we see that. And that's, that's a liberation where there's human becomes divine, divine becomes human without confusing those spheres, but certainly without having divinity be merely an other in the radical that's sense right. of untouching and transcendental. And I think that's Absolutely. one of the things we certainly see here. I'd like to close by repeating something you and I have pointed out from the beginning, and I certainly want to say this as loudly as I can to the critics. You really can't understand the Matrix without understanding all three of them. And I'll use the word gutsy for the 22nd time here. They really don't sh so many of the keys to this are in those last 20 minutes. Mm. I mean, who mm. really would have mm. thought the machines were beings of light? Mm. If you could see them as I see them, they're all made of light. And at that last 20 minutes, it's impossible to miss. They, they switch from the world of flesh in blue color. Neo's blind. He can't be seeing that. They're showing you his point of view, the world of light, the world of spirit. And when he, in a sense, becomes one with that, that redeems these other three realms. The, all three realms have been at war since the very beginning of this. If you look at it that way, and that's a very, very defensible interpretation, I believe, mm -hmm. then you go back and watch all three of these, boy, what a different story you get. Then it becomes a fascinating, all of a sudden these things from the Frenchman to the Oracle saying, guess what? I'm a computer program. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a program from the machines. And you sit there going, wow. At first that's shocking, but now it becomes a part of this rich tapestry that really is coherently woven together. They play fair with you. They give you the clues. They show you it at the end, but it makes it a rich 
rich three-dimensional game of chess instead of this flat land, good versus evil, um, bad guys, good guys sort of Absolutely. nonsense that we get from most movies. Absolutely. And I would say at the philosophic level, if one were to turn to the essay of William James, The Will to Believe, which is a response to an essay by Clifford called The Ethics of Belief, and we've seen the centrality of belief the conditions under which one can believe, ought to believe, consequences of one's belief. At that philosophic level, but cast in very postmodern form and connected to the genre that goes back to Homer through Virgil, through Alexander Pope, up to Nichols Cousin Zakis' great modern odyssey of 1938, that we begin to get a sense of the rich political, aesthetic, existential, spiritual, complexity of this great work of art and it has been a blessing to be in conversation with my dear brother ken about this work cornell you are Very a delight so. and a radiant spirit yourself i must say this has been absolutely delightful i am glad we that now time. we've been very careful i think to give really basically our interpretation of this film we we, we both know the wachowskis um they're very dear friends. We've Absolutely. spent a lot of time with them. Absolutely. But we are giving our interpretation. I think it's fair to say that we have talked with them on occasion and that some of the things we're saying is not totally disagreeable to them. But I think one of the things that's really wonderful is that we know them certainly well enough to know that all of these rich philosophical topics that we're talking about are not something that we just made up. These gentlemen really wanted oh, to put a absolutely. rich philosophical, spiritual, sociological, political statement into a extraordinary tale that is Precisely. compelling, that is visually exciting, that was groundbreaking when it came to what it did in terms of cinema. And I think for all those reasons, I share I, your very, very high opinion of this. Obviously, we can also sit here and give three hours of nitpicking criticism. and But that's really, we're here to celebrate something that we're both convinced is a really cinematic point in, in, uh, in history and that we're very, very pleased they, to be associated with the grand democratic artists and grand democratic intellectuals, voracious readers, seekers of spiritual wisdom and politically involved, concerned about forms of unnecessary social misery Indeed. here and around the world. It's a very unique fusion in these two brothers from Chicago. And I think one of the great things that we've seen is a mark of true great art is that you can read it at a thousand different levels and from a thousand different directions and it's really wonderful that they have not publicly spoken about their interpretations because they wanted everybody to be free to bring their own interpretations to this. I think that's one of the really great things about it. You can watch this as an action sequence if you want and millions of people have watched it and loved it just for the sheer um, joy of watching this level of art and just even the fight sequences and the car chases fantastic we're certainly not against that the great thing about it is you can read deeper and deeper and deeper and when we talk about heidegger and the upanishads and schopenhauer and plato and emerson guess what so do the wachowskis because they know this mm -hmm. stuff i mm -hmm. think that they had the nerve to put that stuff into a commercial Blockbuster like this is an absolutely rare deed. And it's, boy, it's, are we here to celebrate true. that. Absolutely. I mean, like the great Thomas Pynchon, they choose artistic creation over dissemination of information about their art. So it's nice they have two chaps like us who could come in and kind of serve as critics. But they're first and foremost artists, the way Thomas Pynchon, who remains in some sense invisible behind his art, allowing his art to speak for itself. And then we can come in and engage in and our comments. They, and two good looking people like us who are and much the, more. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? In and out they, and through the matrix. Bring a little class what you to talking this procedure. About, brother, what you Absolutely, Absolutely like. my brother. <laughs> hey, my dear brother. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I think that's about it. Thank so. you all for joining us in this. I hope you enjoyed the commentary as much as we did. It has been a delight all around, and we hope to see all of you and talk about this in person one of these days. Goodbye now. Amen.